Yep, whatever. Okay, so this is the Composites and Aerodynamics lecture. Uh, my name is Charles McLeod. Um, I am the Composites lead. I also have a co-lead, his name's Hayden. He's not here today. But, uh, so I'm gonna present to you guys the progress and uh, all of the work that uh, myself and the rest of my hard work at the Composites team has done uh, for the past few quarters. So, let's begin. So, just my personal background and why I'm up here. So I first joined the team in 2014. So the car that you see down in Bytes, uh, myself and some of the other seniors that are on the team, we actually designed and built that car our freshman year. And uh, personally, I was an assistant laminator to the, uh, the lead back then. Um, I worked on the body as well as the dashboard uh, and some of the other composite components. So this was uh, my first composite part that I did, or one of. Um, that's the dashboard. It's, I'm really happy about it. It's really shiny. It came out really nice. Um, and then this is uh, the car that's on display in Bytes, and uh, I helped work on the, the body for that. Um, currently, I'm a fourth year at me, uh, and I have aspirations to attend grad school and get an MSc in advanced composites or material science and engineering. Um, so that's uh, enough about me. So our mission statement, uh, what the composites team is about, and why we're here. So our job is to shepherd the driver's experience uh, with the car vicariously through the bodywork and the other composite components that we design um, in order to vicariously connect the driver and those around, or, uh, around the car um, to it. And what we aim to do is to really form some sort of emotional and uh, attachment to the car based off of the aesthetics and the look and the feel of the car. Because ultimately, uh, the performance of the car is nothing when it, if, if it's not presented well through the aesthetics and the overall design of the car that, which we're responsible for. Um, what I like to think is that if, uh, it's like if you have Ferrari level performance but the looks of a Honda Civic, you're never gonna get to that Ferrari level feel because you're not gonna get past that. And so we aim to, to bridge that gap in performance and the feel of driving the car as well as witnessing the car on the road or just standing next to it through what we design and manufacture. So what we design and manufacture is we are responsible for designing and manufacturing the body components. So before you, you actually have the, the pods here. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, there's one more. Um, it's not here. We have the seat. We have the nose cone as well as the complete body work um, right here. So. We, uh, we designed that, we built it recently. Um, we also work on the dashboard, the steering wheel, uh, and the cockpit design and layout. So we're also responsible for all the ergonomics uh, of the car. Um, additionally, we uh, designed the firewall uh, and the headrest. Um, and eventually we aim to design aerodynamic systems for the car as well. So whether that be a splitter or diffuser or um, more aerodynamic optimizations with the body, uh, that would fall under our responsibility as well. Um, and essentially any component that the driver interacts with uh, directly, uh, with the exception of the pedals, we're responsible for that design and, and uh, ultimately its manufacture, especially if it's composite. Um, other than that, we also specialize in designing the racing livery for the car um, and generally the aesthetics of the car as well as are some of the things that we uh, focus on. So the objective and problem statement. So when I set out on this journey um, last year, uh, I sat down and I thought about what was important for us to improve upon as a team and with respect to composites, as well as what I personally wanted to um, develop more skill in. And what I decided on was I wanted us to have a unique bodywork for the car. Because like I said, I feel that the aesthetics of the car, the look of the car, is very, very important in order to actually um, experience the performance that it has. Um, the body work and these components are some of the most visible components of the car. You don't see the motors of the car. You don't see the batteries. All of these components are tucked away under things that we've made or tucked away behind wheels or other things. And it's ultimately up to the composites to really show off the car and hopefully entice others to look at it and to look deeper and to, to, to wonder about the performance of it because hopefully these parts look so good that they think, well, then the performance must also be just as good, if not better. 
Um, and so in order to do that, uh, what I decided is that this car needs to have a really unique bodywork. Um, and I wanted to be able to improve upon the past work that I had done since my freshman year, um, just for own personal growth reasons. Um, and really to push the design envelope and to do something with composites that, at least here at UCR, uh, we hadn't done before. And to really push the limits of what I was capable of uh, doing just as a, a laminator in general with wet layout. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to pass on, uh, pass on the, the knowledge and experience that I've uh, earned in through, through four years of doing this. Um, I'm pretty much entirely self-taught, so I really wanted to pass that on to others and hopefully they can take that and build it up and to make things that are better than I could have made when I first started. And actually that did happen. That's, that's what you see here with the seat. Uh, this seat is far better than the seat I made uh, on my own. And um, you know, I'm not really responsible for making the seat. Other people did that I taught. And so I'm really happy about how this came out, um, given the fact that it's people learning from me and also from Hayden uh, and using that and applying it to, to something different. And I'm really happy with how that came out. It's better than anything I've made. Um, and the other thing is uh, next year, what we aim to do is we aim to design aerodynamic components and more, integrate more ergonomics into the car. Uh, I think there's a gap in chassis design into where we focus on designing the suspension first and then we design the chassis based off suspension points. But we're missing the driver. The driver is what actually is the most important, not the suspension, not anything else, because ultimately a driver has to sit in the car, has to drive it, has to interact with it. And so what we hope to do in the coming years is to um, improve upon that process and to put the driver first in all of this uh, and make the driver the, the most important aspect of the car. Because at the end of the day, it's a car and cars are driven by people. So that's really important. And, ho and hopefully we uh, can design a monocoque uh, sometime in the future. So um, a monocoque would essentially mean that this body here would be the chassis in of itself. Uh, rather than having a steel chassis and a body that covers it, um, the body itself would be the chassis, and I think that would be a, a really good goal for our team in the next couple of years. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to go over maybe a few more slides, but how, what were some improvements on the seat from last year's? Um, some general improvements was, for one, the seat that I had worked on. Uh, unfortunately, no one actually could really fit in it. Um, granted, I didn't design last year's seat, but uh, it was made too small. So when it came time for, uh, for the new people to design a seat, um, more specifically Zoo designed the seat, so when it came time for her to do it, uh, made sure that, and it went through many, many design, uh, redesigns, but we made sure that it could fit people, um, ranging from someone as small as her to someone as big as like Zach, who uh, <laughs> is quite tall. So um, that was one of the biggest things is that, like I said, we put the driver first. Back then, I don't know how the seat was designed because I wasn't part of that decision, but clearly the driver wasn't quite considered because the driver couldn't even fit in. Um, we also did uh, made improvements to the overall um, comfort of the seat. I believe this seat is, is much more comfortable. Um, it looks nicer, the finish is nicer. The overall manufacturing of it is it's much, much better. And um, like I said, I'm very happy about it because I didn't necessarily build this or, or, or um, design it. It wasn't my project, it was someone else's. I'm really happy about that. Because that means that people are learning those lessons that are so important. So uh, what I'm going to be going through now is the design process. So you see all these parts, and these are all the final products of um, about three quarters of labor. Um, so a very long and arduous process to get to this stage uh, that you see now. So to get there, it all starts with the design process. And the very first thing I do is I, I, I go through a concept generation phase. So during the summer, last summer, um, Hayden and I, we, we set out on this mission to design this unique body. And we started very, very early. A lot of components uh, for this car hadn't even design, been designed. In fact, the chassis wasn't even finalized by the time we started designing. And that was OK. It meant we had to redesign the, chassis, uh, the body many, many times, as I'll get to. But that's OK. It's all part of the process. And um, ultimately, we, we start by uh, looking at different cars for inspiration. So. Um, this model Lexus is one of my favorite cars. Uh, I really I like the way that the, the headlights or the, the taillights blend into the back. Um, there are other features of other cars that I incorporated. 
um, as well as I look towards uh, other FSAE cars to see what is it that other teams are doing, what is it that they're doing that I like a lot, that I don't like, and most of all, where are their, uh, their shortcomings when it comes to designing a body, what sort of things are they missing. Um, and from there, uh, I take a, uh, essentially I make a little template that's this. This is the chassis template. So my design started out very simple. It was just that. It's just a side view. And I essentially sketched over on, um, I think it was on Paint or Illustrator, the, the side view of the chassis. Because ultimately the body, this body, it fits over the chassis. So I'm very limited with what I can do because I have to cover up this. So as you can see, there's not much from the side that I'm actually able to change because I have to cover up that chassis. So it comes down to, at least at first, the actual nose design. And so I spent a lot of time doing that, as you'll see in the next slide. Or one of the next slides. But this is uh, some more of the concept generation. So this is another car I looked at. I looked at the BMW M3. One of the uh, key features I took off of that that I really liked was um, this fade. So like I said, the side view, there's not much I can do. So I need to add features to the sides that, that make the car look um, visually interesting and, and compelling enough to want you to hopefully look into it more and to, to get closer to it. Um, another thing I looked towards was, uh, was nature. I looked at the gills of sharks when designing the opening of the pod. Um, this car has, a, in my opinion, a very organic and natural look to it. It flows well. That was one of the things that I thought was very important to me and something that I didn't always see in FSE cars. A lot of cars, their bodies are very blocky and they just cover up the chassis and that's kind of it. Um, so I wanted something that flows well. And so with that, when I designed the pods, I looked towards sharks because um, I wanted something that also had a natural influence to and the gills of sharks. In fact, this photo in particular um, really inspired the opening. Um, the other thing I looked at was just F1 cars and the pod design there. Uh, the, the rear, the actual way that this pod closes together was inspired directly from the way uh, F1 pods are designed. I just really like the way it flows. So um, during this uh, concept generation phase, I did a lot of sketching. Um, I think it's really important that before you even start 3D modeling, you, you get a sketchbook and you do a lot of drawings. Um, those who know me, they know that I like to work with my hands way more than I like to work with computers. I think there's uh, an importance to having scale models, to doing things by hand first, and fully understanding what it is you're trying to design by trying to do it by hand, whether that be sketching it or sculpting it, whatever it is, and then from there, um, modeling it on the computer. So these are some of the very early concepts I did of the pods. At first they were inspired actually by uh, the intakes on jet engines, but that just didn't seem to flow right for me. And then these were just some of the very basic um, side views of it. Um, not the best artist, but this was how I came about the actual concepts, which is by sketching them, and I kept a, a dated sketchbook. And all of these images are actually uploaded to the SVN, and they're all dated, so you can actually see how the design um, changed from the start to the finish. I went from just that very bland, very boring side template to a much more complete and holistic design. Um, and that process took about uh, two and a half months of Hayden and I working pretty consistently um, during the summer. I mean, we came in almost every day and we'd work for several hours and we, you know, a lot of the time we wouldn't get much progress, but it was a start and it just builds. So for the process of 3D modeling, so once you're doing these sketches or alongside your sketches, um, you'll want a 3D model list. So I worked in tandem with uh, my co-lead Hayden to do the 3D modeling. Um, I think it's important to work with at least another person because they may have input or ideas that are different than yours and that can add a lot of value to your designs. It can make your designs much better or open up um, new avenues that you just didn't see or you couldn't have seen on your own. So um, all the sketches I did, Hayden then took those sketches and would model them on the computer. So this was the version one of the body design. And as you can see, it's completely different from the actual final version of the body that you see here today. And uh, essentially the reason for that is one, just iterative design. So again, it goes back to the importance of continuously sketching, reevaluating designs, showing them to people or, or checking them, and then 
moving on to something better. And you just keep building and building and building until you get to your final design, and then ultimately you make it. Um, and that process can take a lot of time, so it's really important, uh, at least in my opinion, to set aside um, as much time as you can, in this case I set aside the summer, to designing these parts. Um, same goes for the pods, the pods I modeled and used uh, SolidWorks surfacing for. Um, all of these models can be found on the SVN. Um, and uh, even all the different versions are on the SVN. One of the key things that actually came up, and I'll go over this more later, um, that allowed us to really push the design envelope was the fact that um, we were able to get our molds machined. So initially, Aiden and I were looking at actually sculpting this. I mean, we would have had to take foam blocks and stack them up and then sculpt them into a shape. So we had to keep the shape very simple, which is why the version one is also so different from the final version, because we were able to get it machined. So the next step of the design process is ultimately your design review and uh, doing a scale model. So like I said, I think um, it's very important to evaluate your designs in person, especially if you're working with anything um, aesthetic or uh, anything really visual, um, print it out, or, or um, if you can, get a scale model made. So we had a scale model actually machined of our body design, and that really allowed me to see the car, um, or see the body from all sorts of angles that are harder to visualize on the computer, and have it, you know, have something tangible in your hands that you can feel the surface of, and, or you can look and, and play around with, is I think really valuable. Um, if you don't have access to machining, maybe invest in 3D, uh, 3D printing it, or um, quickly carve something. I mean, you can always sculpt. You can sculpt the design really quickly if you know how to. There's a lot of different ways to produce these designs quickly, um, and to just give yourself an idea of what it is you're making, uh, even if it's not exactly accurate. Um, and one of the other important things that we did was uh, once we had you know design that we felt we were comfortable with. Um, Aiden and I had uh, the rest of the team evaluate it and uh, critique it. And this may be a scary process for some people, but having constructive criticism from your teammates, even and those who may know nothing about composites or what you're doing, having their input can sometimes be incredibly insightful and open you up to new ideas that you, like I said, you wouldn't have seen before. Um, and ultimately, hopefully, help you to design something that you weren't going to design before and help you design something better. So once, you, um, once you've designed your parts, the next step in this process uh, is ultimately the planning phase. The planning phase is really is incredibly important, and I think it's actually the most important step in manufacture, or in the production of any, any sort of part, whether it be composites or um, something made of aluminum. It's important to plan out what you're gonna do, how it's gonna be implemented, um, and hopefully to see uh, any sort of potential um, errors that could come about as you're making these parts. And so every step in the manufacturing process was outlined and laid out in detail uh, on Excel. Um, again, that document is on the uh, SVN. Um, granted, that document is a bit dated. We actually manufactured it in a completely different way. But it was a good exercise, at least for me, to think about, uh, one, the logistics of making you know, a body. This is, this is a lot of work. And back then, I didn't have um, such a large composites team as I have now. It was just Hayden and I. So it was even more uh, daunting of a task for two people to do layup of something this big. And I'll get more into that later. Um, and it's also important to consider all the materials you need and the tools and other chemicals and things along the way. So the manufacturing was done um, through a, a partnership with Whistler Designs. It's a local machinist uh, in Riverside. And he's partnered with us to be able to machine all of our molds. So that really enabled us to push the design envelope and to make something better um, than we could have done manually. So this is our, our pod molds, and uh, this is the half of the body mold, um, just as they were getting machined. And we ended up manufacturing these, these molds over the course of our Thanksgiving break. Um, it took us about, I think, one day of working with him. And then we did the, the mold prep. So the mold prep is a pretty lengthy process, and this is where your planning comes in because you need to know what you're going to do. And the mold prep is incredibly important um, because if you mess up at the mold prep, then it doesn't matter how well you do with the remaining steps, you're, you're going to be screwed. 
So you have to make sure that the mold preparation is done um, patiently and attentively, uh, or else you may fail later on. Um, this process took us about three weeks during fall quarter, so just basically before finals and into the Christmas break. Um, my team and I worked on preparing these molds. And they went through a process of sanding, uh, coating them in drywall, uh, painting on styroshield, more sanding, resin, and um, a lot of other chemicals at the time. Um, then came the actual uh, wet layup, the process that makes these parts that are here. So this took us actually two days. Um, which I find to be a bit funny because you spend you know, months getting to this phase and these parts literally take about two or three hours to make. So as you can see, planning, effective planning is incredibly important because these resins only have a working time of about two hours that can sort of be stretched out to about three. So that means you have two hours to, to make something as simple as a nose, but you also only have about two hours to make something as complex and as large as the body. This is a very difficult thing to wrap your head around sometimes because you'd think that this would take more time, but it actually takes the same amount of time it took to make this. So as you can see, when you're doing composites, you have to effectively plan and set up your, your workflow because, and this takes a good knowledge of the uh, actual steps of making these things, um, because ultimately, if you mess up during the sweat layup, all of that work was for nothing. There's nothing you can do about it. You, you may be screwed because a lot of these molds are one-time use and uh, months and months and months of planning and work are completely thrown out because of two hours where you messed up and you didn't do it right. So what I did is I used these, uh, the, the layup process as a teaching moment for my team. So like I said, uh, the only people who actually knew how to do any sort of composites when we started this was just Hayden and myself which I find to be a bit remarkable because ultimately we took a lot of people who were completely untrained, unversed in composites and were able to make all of these parts. And um, we're able to make some pretty complex, complex parts and I think high quality parts uh, from people who knew absolutely nothing about composites just hours before they started. And the way we did that was um, one, Hayden and myself, we have a lot of experience doing this. So we're able to, in essence, make more time as we're doing this process, turn those two hours into something that feels longer by effectively planning and setting up our workshop, by having fabric pre-cut, or having bagging materials properly staged, or having someone mixing resin the entire time. So that way, the process can keep going. And it's also important to start your team off with the simplest of parts. So when we did this, you know, we started off making the nose. Having the entire team who knows nothing about composites jump in and make uh, something as complex as the body is just destined to fail. I mean, we had sheets that were the length of the, the car body that we had to lay up. So you start with something very simple that hopefully on your own you could probably make in about an hour, but because you're teaching it will take the full time, and that's okay, because you know what you're doing and you're able to um, show people how to do it. From there, in that same day, we ended up making uh, a really complex part, we made the pods. So we had two, basically, in tandem, we made both pods all at once. Again, all this just took about two or three hours. Um, and that was the end of, of, that, of that work day. Um, the whole work day probably was about, about eight hours of work, staging everything and getting everyone set up was a lot of time. A lot of time is spent briefing everyone so they knew what they were doing. But again, you're, you only have a very limited amount of time to work on everything. Um, so these are some of the photos of the actual process. So this was the nose during the wet layup. Um, this is what I was talking about, about teaching other people how to do the process. This is us making the, the nose as well. Um, this is me uh, doing one of the wet layups for the, the, the body. So this body was actually manufactured upside down and you could actually sit inside the mold. Um, so and sometimes we had our shortest team members get inside there to do the uh, resin application because it's very difficult for someone who's like six foot like me to sit inside there in the cramped space and make this stuff. Um, and then this is the pods after they had uh, cured. Uh, the post-manufacturing process. So after these parts have been made, which again only took about two days, um, then begins your, your next and probably your longest step, at least after designing and planning. 
Uh, and that's the post manufacturing. So this is actually a process that's still going on right now. Um, these parts you see here, uh, the, the seat and the body are technically not finished. There's going to be more sanding and polishing that goes in them to make them look the same as the pods of the nose. Um, and this is the longest phase. This phase actually, we're almost done now and it took us all of winter quarter. So we met consistently throughout the winter quarter and um, my team would come over, they'd spend the night at my, at my house and we'd work throughout the night from Friday to Sunday, just constantly working on these parts. Um, and I think for future teams, this is actually a really good moment for them to, um, to, to, to bond and to turn what could be a really tedious and boring task into something that could be a really fun weekend. Um, and it just requires the right atmosphere uh, and the right people, but uh, I think we did that pretty effectively, um, and that was really, really nice. I like that. Um, so essentially what we did is we manufactured the body, the nose, the pods, um, all in the first weekend of winter quarter, uh, and then all the post-manufacturing was done following that. So we met pretty consistently, um, you know, almost every other weekend or so, uh, working on these parts uh, to get them done and get them here as you see now. And that takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of time, a lot of effort, but if you use your time and effort and use it all uh, properly, you can do it in one quarter, if not less. Especially if you have enough people. And so these are some of the photos. So this was um, some of us, uh, some of my teammates, holding up the pods after we had taken them out of the, uh, the molds. So they look completely different than this one here. So as you can see, a lot of work goes into turning that part with all the mold that's still on it, something that's dull, unpolished, untrimmed, into something shiny, reflective, and ready to have a livery wrapped onto it. Um, this is us doing the sanding. There's a lot of sanding involved. And uh, this is me um, dremeling out the uh, nose cone, almost before my dremel actually burned out. <laughs> yeah. So how do you actually apply the resin? Um, do you just pour it on, or do you have something that kind of moves it around, or I mean, it doesn't have brush strokes or anything? So. Right. So the way you apply this is actually um, it's actually quite simple. So let's take the nose for example. So the nose sits in the mold upside down like this. So when you're applying everything, you actually see the back. You don't see the front. Uh, same goes for actually all of these parts you see here. You all you are working off of the inside surface. The reason for that is because um, the way composites works is that the actual mold surface is going to give you the best surface on the part, meaning that whatever part of the component is touching the mold is going to be the part of the component that looks the best. And since these parts you know, are all for aesthetic reasons, you want that to be the outside part, obviously. And so the way that this was made uh, was essentially we take resin and you mix it in this epoxy resin, and you pour the resin and you pour the resin into this, and from there, you're actually using uh, pucks. They, they, sometimes they call them squeegees in the industry. I, I call them pucks. And you are essentially taking these pucks and you're dragging it across the surface to force the resin into the fibers. Um, this process is known as wet layup. There are other types of uh, manufacturing that you can execute. Um, one of the best ways to do it, actually the best way to do it, is to do it through prepreg. Um, currently, at this time, we don't have the ability to manufacture things out of prepreg. We just simply don't have the um, machinery. You need uh, ovens or an autoclave, and you need special molds that we just don't have access to. And what is that? And really briefly, what is prepreg? So prepreg is short for pre-impregnated carbon fiber. So essentially, through this process, we're taking a dry fabric, and through wet layup, we turn it into a wet fabric, with, meaning it has resin in it, and then that cures over the process of about 24 hours. And then you can demold your product, or if maybe you, you may be doing it through several applications through a process called, um, I think we call it wet bonding or wet fusing, where you fuse more and more pieces of, red, of, uh, of fabric onto the part um, while the resin's still curing. But essentially, with prepreg, all of that dirty work of applying resin, having to wear chemical suits like some of my teammates wear, um, you, uh, you cut that out and you essentially apply a sticker. Um, it's a really cool process. Another clean process of doing this that we don't uh, currently do is uh, called resin infusion. Essentially imagine that we laid out all of this part. So you have the seat sitting in its mold. We have um, special bagging material draped across it. In one pot we have the resin. On the other side we have a vacuum pump and the resin's pumped through and using special uh, matri uh, matrices uh, the resin is able to infuse 
hence the name, through the fabric. It's a very clean process, it's a very precise process. It's also um, a very uh, uh, difficult process to do, and um, so I started with the easiest, the one that I knew the best, and hence the one that I knew would work the first time, not after many tries, and we don't have that sort of time. So that's why we use what we have. So the post-manufacturing, what's next? So this is really directed at those who um, have just joined the team or are looking to join the composites team. Uh, we still need to sand and polish the body, the seat, the dashboard. We have to finish preparing the rear body panel molds. Um, and we need to fit all these components to the chassis at some point. Uh, this shouldn't take that long compared to everything else we've done up to this point. I think it can be done over the course of maybe two or three design sessions, so not that much time, honestly. Um, and we also need to finalize the livery and wrap the body. So we're looking for people who would like to help out with these things. If you're interested in joining the Composites team, you still have a chance. You actually still have a chance to learn how to do what we've done here. Um, and the cool thing is, you'll be learning it not just from me, but from other people on the team who are experienced and well-versed in this stuff, um, if not better than myself, because they started doing it better than I did when I started. So that's a really uh, lucky thing that you have. So just some of the recommendations and conclusions. So um, this is really directed at future teams who may be seeing this presentation, but start designing early. If you want to do something different, different takes a lot of time. And you can't whip out a good design, effectively at least, during fall quarter and, if, and expect to have everything just line up in time and have all your ducks lined up, ready for the competition, at least not having your team stressed out, you stressed out, everyone stressed out because you started late. What you need to do is you need to start during the summer. So that's what we did. We started in July and we finished it in September. We were actually ready to manufacture most of these components back in September, but we waited until we had more resources, more people, so that way um, that vision that was outlined earlier could, could be executed to teaching people. Um, set realistic goals for yourself when you want these parts finished and make a plan. And um, ultimately the actual timeline that we had was we uh, did the mold manufacturing in fall after the design in summer. Uh, we did the prep in fall quarter, and then winter was the part manufacturing and post manufacturing. In spring, we've been using this time now to actually just start planning for the next year's car. So we're the, I think we're probably the first sub team to have most of their components done, and um, we're using that opportunity to start planning for next year's car. Even if it means redesigning entirely, that's okay because it's iterative design. You're trying to to work off of what you've done in the past and make something better. Um, continually grow the team, never say no to people who want to join, even if it's right before the end, let them join. There's always things that they can learn and things that they can contribute um, and make them feel welcome. Um, another thing that I strongly believe in is always split up your tasks uh, with everything that you do, rather it be the layup or the design, share the load between multiple people so that way other people can get involved and hopefully find something that they enjoy. Um, and make lists or visual diagrams that organize your workflow. So as my teammates know, uh, when we do layups, I brief everybody, I make lists, I lay out everything that we're gonna do, and I plan it out, I give tasks to people, and then I put them in charge of other people, and we go, we start everything, and it all comes together perfectly. Um, the reason we did that happens is because we have a very organized workflow. It means that those, like I said, those two hours, those three hours that you have to make a part, it, it feels like it's much longer because everything is already set in motion, everything's good, there's nothing to stress about. Um, and also we have lots of documentation, so we have photos, we have videos, we have spreadsheets, I've written instruction manuals, um, all of my sketches are on the SVN, all of these things are out there because uh, hopefully you, um, you want to share this knowledge with other people and be a good steward of the program. So future teams can, can learn and build off of what we've done and not start over. Um, some of the difficulties in doing this have been the time and manpower limitations. So um, I've been incredibly fortunate to have such a large sub-team, but it wasn't always this way. Uh, my junior year, it was actually just myself, and then eventually I got uh, Hayden to join, and from there it was just us two. So during the summer, we were actually planning all of these components that you see here, manufacturing them as just two people, which would have been incredibly difficult, versus now we have a sub-team of eight people. Um, but Time and manpower limitations still persist. There's still things that we would like to do, even with such a big sub-team, that we simply can't. And it, you have to be realistic about what you can and cannot do with what you have, and also with what you know. And that goes to my next point, which is my own personal skill limitations. So there are things about composites that I'm just not well-versed in, 
you know, when designing these parts, um, I had to be risk averse. I only have one shot to make these parts. They take, you know, months and thousands of dollars of planning and money spent. Um, so there's only so much that I can do and only so many risks I can take. So I have to be very calculated about how I do that. In this case, the risk I took was the body design and making something that I thought, you know, pushed the limits and is drastically better than what we had done before, but in a way that was also cautious enough that I knew we could get it right the first time with people who were completely inexperienced with composites. Um, and then there's the actual design and manufacturing restrictions that come with wet land within composites, and that's something true for any material. So evolving the sub-team, um, the aesthetics and engineering. Uh, what I mean by this is these parts were designed mostly with the aesthetics in mind. And some people may not like this. Um, some people may think we should have more engineering into these parts. And I agree. But the thing is, is that when that summer I was planning out these parts and what I wanted to focus on, uh, I decided to focus on ultimately the aesthetics because one, it was a good opportunity for me to progress my skills in composites. And two, I thought it would really help to um, elevate the team to a new level. We have such a unique car. We're the only team in North America at the moment uh, making four custom electric motors. That's an incredible achievement. It, it also needs to have a really nice, badass looking body because where's that achievement going if it doesn't look good, if it's not presentable? Um, so that's why I focus on the aesthetics first. Uh, ultimately, I had to choose one because it was just Hayden and I. And um, I didn't have the ability nor did I have the time to dedicate to both tasks, so I picked one of the tasks. Um, moving forward though, because you know, we have a bigger sub-team now, um, we're the largest, uh, because we have such a good group of people, we're gonna be combining the aesthetics with the actual engineering uh, of these parts. What I mean by that is we're gonna be incorporating um, several uh, following avenues. So we're gonna be working with um, aerodynamics and computational fluid dynamics. I wanna do better modeling. Uh, when designing the body. Uh, there's pretty much no CFD done when designing the body. We designed something that looked good and that looked like it would be aerodynamic, but that's all we did. We didn't do calculations, there's no math done, and um, that's something that we need to work on you know, in the following years. Um, we're gonna be designing a diffuser and a splitter. Uh, I'm really excited about that. Those will be some of the first aero components we've ever made as a team. And we're gonna co coordinate with the chassis sub team to design a more ergonomic chassis like I said, bring the driver uh, into the equation, hopefully first, by making some sort of um, uh, chassis mock-up that one of our uh, sub-team members has already designed. Um, and then eventually, you know, within the next few years, I would really like to see the team design and, match, and manufacture a uh, CFRP monocoque, carbon fiber reinforced polymer monocoque. Um, if we really want to elevate the program to the level of other teams like the Germans, that's where we have to go next. Um, and I think there are plenty of avenues in there to just incorporate some really cool aesthetics into these designs. Because if you ever look at these monocoques, they all look the same. Um, just for reference, this was some of the CFD that we did do. It's again, very limited. Um, it honestly doesn't provide much data, but it was a start. Um, and then that's a picture of a uh, monocoque that an FSAE team did. Um, so new members, where you'd fit in. Uh, so you would help us design next year's car. You'd be working with the experienced members that we already have, um, working with us to design the next, uh, the next big thing for us. Um, this is a photo of us uh, after we had manufactured the body. <laughs> um, and then you'd be working with us to design the remaining parts, to finish the remaining parts that we have, and most of all to, to work with us to, to progress in the next, um, the next year. You'd be learning how to design and manufacture composite molds and components. And you'd be part of the, uh, currently the team's largest sub-team, as well as the, um, the most hands-on sub-team. We work a lot with our hands. And if you are really into art, like uh, you know, designing, um, uh, sketching, drawing, painting, sculpting, if you really like those sort of things, working with your hands, this is the best sub-team, I think, for you to join, because that's pretty much all that we do. And uh, yeah, it's a, I think it's a pretty good team to join. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, any questions?